All right, so so the verses, are you feeling ready for the verses themselves? All right, so I am a nerd, so I find outlines very useful. Um, just so you know, what's the point of this verse? What's the context for this verse? And so in 37 practices, verses one through seven are just preparation. They're just getting you ready to be a bodhisattva or to adopt a bodhisattva's mentality. They're not actually there yet. It's kind of like, you know, cleaning the room before guests come. It's just kind of getting the space settled so that when you bring in this very precious state of mind, it actually isn't too crowded by other obstacles. Then after that, we'll have part two, which is the main teaching, illuminating the path. So it'll give us just kind of a cursory nod to beings of lesser capacity and beings of medium capacity, the small scope and the medium scope, just so that we remember that those are essential foundations. And then the whole rest of the text is bodhicitta, bodhicitta, bodhicitta. So that's kind of how it's laid out, a bit of preliminaries and then um, just kind of connecting with the three scopes and then into bodhicitta or Rama. So the opening and the introductory verses, you guys have this in your main text as well. It says, Namo Lokeshvarie. You see that all things are beyond coming and going, yet still you strive solely for the sake of living beings. To you, my precious guru, inseparable from Lord Avlokita, I perpetual homage respectfully with body, speech, and mind. The perfect Buddhas, who are the source of all benefit and joy, come into being through accomplishing the sacred dharma. And since this, in turn, depends on knowing how to practice, I shall now describe the practices of all the Buddha's heirs. So those are the verses, then what do they mean? So this Namo Lokeshvarie, Namo means I pay homage, Loka signifies the world or universe, Ishvara, all-powerful master in the vocative case, Aya. So then the first line means, I pay homage to you, the Lord of the universe. The Lord of the universe is Avalokiteshvara. Avalokiteshvara is compassion itself, appearing in the form of a deity. Aware of the suffering of all living beings, he is known in Tibetan as Chenrezig, which means he who sees all. So Avalokiteshvara Chenrezig, or the Buddha of compassion, the embodiment of compassion, he'll manifest in whatever form is appropriate to help others. As a Buddha, a bodhisattva of the 10th level, a deity, a spiritual teacher, or even as an ordinary person or an animal, great bodhisattvas like Avalokiteshvara manifest in our world for the benefit of beings. And so the point here is that we're paying homage to an ideal that is already growing within us because we become receptive to what we respect. So if we say to ourselves, you know, like I prostrate to compassion and wisdom, what we're saying to ourselves is compassion and wisdom are important to me. I already have some and I want it to be deeper and I want it to be more vast. And this is the orientation of my whole life. These are my core values. And by kind of personifying compassion and wisdom in the form of this deity, really having something I can relate to and something I can kind of bounce ideas off of, as well as something I can listen deeply for when I'm around any living being. So I'm kind of listening for the Chenrezig-ness in anyone I'm in front of. And if I'm listening in that way, I hear things that will enrich my own compassion and bodhic in my own compassion and wisdom. So, you know, the guru then is the, about the next verses here. So the guru is seen as one in nature with great compassion, Avalokiteshvara Chenrezig. Our Buddhahood his, their, her Buddhahood relies on the guru and the three jewels, namely the internally realized Dharma jewel. So what we're saying is that if I want to become a Buddha, I need to accomplish the sacred Dharma. And that's exactly what all Buddhas who came before me have done. And my own teachers are inseparable from Avalokiteshvara Chenrezig. When I'm adopting that mental attitude, 
I hear advice directly from them. Now, if your teacher is just a regular person with regular qualities, nothing significant other than they love Buddhism and they're trying their best, you can still connect with them as like the representative of the Buddha. And even if they're just talking a normal Dharma class, if you're listening for Chen Rezig, you'll get the advice of Chen Rezig. And this is the important kind of thing with guru devotion. So some of you might have a guru and some of you might not. Um, having guru devotion as the beginning of the path and the beginning of many texts for Westerners is very problematic um, because we're either too dismissive or too eager. <laughs> yes, we either say, I, I'm my own boss, I'm my own guru, I listen to my own internal wisdom, no one tells me what to do, and I'll just cherry pick the fun parts of all religions and mush them together and make my own thing, because of course I know best, right? Or, <laughs> dad, save me, tell me what to do, right? And so we can fall into one of those two camps very easily, where we're just like, nah, or save me, and it's very human and very natural, um, you might be someone who grew up with a lot of authoritarianism. And so it's either something you rebel against or something you're very comfortable with, you know. And the whole concept of a guru as being divine is totally problematic, right? It's like the foundation of all cults. So this is not what Buddhism is talking about, but it's what it sounds like it's talking about, doesn't it? Right? And we want to really be asking ourselves... Who are we talking to and what are we listening for? And if you remember that the Dharmakaya mind of all the Buddhas is pervasive. It exists everywhere in the whole universe. And its ability to connect with us is based on our own karma, not based on how much it loves us, right? It's, it's, it's unbiased. It loves everyone equally. So what we're trying to do is create receptor sites you know, and openness to the help that's already coming towards us. And at some point, we want to be able to do that with anything and everyone that's in front of us and see everything as our teacher and everything as the guru. But it's a bit too mind blowing to do that right at the beginning. So you just pick one guy, <laughs> just this, I'll just use this one, right. And it's someone who has qualities that are worldly, I guess, from a worldly perspective, you're able to assess them, which means ethics, you know, so you kind of have your tick list of, I'm going to choose this person as my gateway to the divine. They are not the divine. They're my gateway to the divine. They're my access point. They're the way in which I can hear the teachings in a personal, specific, and direct way. They might be a Buddha. They might not be a Buddha. They might be a Bodhisattva. They might be a regular Shmo. But I've chosen them as this, which means I will hear the divine through them. And you will if you listen in that way. You know, if you're thinking, I'm just so frustrated with my mother's eating disorder. I don't know, whatever. My mother's fine, don't worry. But I mean, you know, you're just thinking of that in class. I'm so worried about my mother's eating disorder. I'm so worried about it. Buddhas, I just really need some new ideas about how to manage this. Often in the class, in a general teaching to thousands of people, you'll hear this like specific advice about people with that particular did I say that out loud? <laughs> like, and it, it really, it can happen. Maybe some of you have already experienced it. Then the problem is you can, you start to think, oh, that guy who said it, he must be clairvoyant and he must be magic and he must be the source of all perfection. And it's him specifically that I should devote to rather than like the guru-ness, you know, or this kind of deeper concept of the guru or the teacher. Yeah, when you're listening for teacher and teachings, you hear teacher and teachings. When you're in a student mindset, you're receptive. But then we try and make shortcuts and say, I'll just do whatever that one particularly says, because I like him. Forgetting that, you know, once they come off the throne and then you go out to coffee, they might say something a little off color or they might do something a bit abrupt. And then you're trying to squeeze your mind into this mental gymnastics that says, oh, he's showing the aspect of irritation to the coffee barista in order to show me that I shouldn't do that. And you start doing all this mental gymnastics. It could just be he was like hungry and his blood sugar was low and he needed a biscuit, you know, like don't overthink it. You can choose to make it a teaching. 
but don't feel like it has to be. It's, it's your choice how quickly you titrate the teachings into your own kind of developmental ability. Yeah, because on one level, the teacher is teaching you constantly, continuously, specifically for you. But on the other hand, your karma isn't able to hear it every second of every day. And if you completely opened yourself up, it might blow your fuses. Yeah, and so just gently, gently, gently opening a window here, opening a window there at a speed that you're able to digest. D does that make sense? Like all of this talk about the guru is the Buddha. It's a mentality to adopt, particularly during teachings. Y you know, it's not something you want to take so literally. Tantric practitioners, there's another level of it, but still even that is not quite as literal as it sounds in like the prayers and practices. You're not giving up autonomy. You're encouraging a collaboration. I want the outer guru and the inner guru to have a really smooth communication pathway so that I can become much more enriched and enlivened by being in a Dharma teaching. If I hear it as general information, it becomes general information. If I hear it as personal advice, it goes in as personal advice. So it's, it's a more empowering teaching than it sounds like sometimes when you read the traditional texts. There's a lot under the surface about what it is to have a guru and how it is to relate to them. So seeing them as inseparable from Avalokiteshvara Chenrezig, the Buddha of compassion, this is very powerful because that's what you're saying. You want to be your teacher in life, compassion and wisdom. So I'm going to listen to it from this source and this source and this source, and I'm going to try and hear the Dharma is indivisible from that energy. That, does, does that make sense? Tibetan Buddhism is all about the guru, but um, you have to be careful. <laughs> All right, so we'll keep going unless you've got um, questions about the guru. That's our only guru talk for the whole weekend. So now or never. Okay, so we'll keep going with it. Okay, so we've done those two, <clears throat> the intro and the opening verses. So now the actual verses. Um, the outline is first, the need to give meaning to this human existence of yours. So rare and difficult to find. And I think the outline is actually as profound as the verse, the need to give meaning, right? Not the discover meaning or have it bestowed upon you or search for it. It's, you have to decide, you know, you, you get to decide what is the point of all this? How about I create a meaning that's based in altruism because of all of these benefits of doing so? It's putting you in the driver's seat, which I think is really empowering. So the practice of all the bodhisattvas to study, reflect, and meditate tirelessly, both day and night, without ever straying into idleness, in order to free oneself and others from this ocean of samsara, having gained the supreme vessel, a free, well-favored human life, so difficult to find. So this thinking is the catalyst for taking full advantage of this life. The rareness is important. It's important to think how rare it is to be a human being. You know, it doesn't seem like it's that rare. There's however many billion of us, but just the ants under our house right now, you know, probably outnumber most of the, you know, sentient beings of other types in the whole area, you know? And so all of those ants under our feet, under our foundation of our house, they all have Buddha nature. They all can become enlightened, but they can't study right now. <laughs> You know, the little ants aren't like doing their little lines back and forth, studying and reciting mantras and explaining the Dharma to one another when they had their little antennas going back and forth. They're just getting the job done. You know, they're just living their life. And so while they're an ant, they're not getting any work done for the spiritual path. And we have been an ant so many times in so many realms. We've been so many different kinds of beings where the conditions didn't come together for us to study, reflect, and meditate. And so it's, it's a big deal. It's, it's a really big deal that we're a human being. And with that kind of sense of, oh, wow, this is a rare thing. Normally, I'm swirling around in the hell realms, or normally I'm hanging out in the god realms, or often I'm an animal of this or that type. And in those lives, I get very little work done because it's either too distracting or too pleasant or too painful. 
So I'm distracted. I can't. A human has enough suffering and enough happiness. It's like the perfect balance because you've seen hard times and you understand that suffering is something that really does exist. It makes you question the causes of suffering, it makes you look at the habits and patterns that perpetuate it. And you have happiness, you know, you have friends and family and joyful things that enrich your life. And that makes you think relief is possible because sometimes I have relief from this mess. What are the causes of happiness? You've got mental space as a human being that you don't have in any other realm as, as much at least. And that means that you can practice. And then if you didn't practice, it would be such a waste. You know, it would be such a waste. So, you know, if you died right now and then you were a dog for 15 years and then you were a human again, you might be like a really nice dog and take care of your young really well and connect well with the people in your life and, and do some good stuff and not just drain your merit. You might even accumulate some good karma, but you would not be studying, <laughs> you know, and you would not be meditating. You know, I'm looking at my cats right now. They're in class, but they're not paying attention. They don't care what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter how beautiful the PowerPoint is. They don't care. They really don't. What they know is that when I'm talking like this, it's uncomfortable to sit in my lap. And so they're disgruntled and they're sitting over there. So, you know, we don't want to be animals. And yes, dolphins are amazing and smart, but not even dolphins. Okay. So <laughs> I say this because at every Dharma group, someone's like, I want to be a dolphin in my next life. I'm like, no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Um, so a human life might not feel as valuable as it is if you're not having the kind of life that you planned for yourself. But now that you've met the spiritual path, actually you have absolutely everything you need because you have enough physical health for independence. Yeah, independent movement, you know, even if you use a wheelchair or something like that, you, ha you have a physical body that is able to come to class and a physical mind that is not impaired to the degree that you're not able to learn new things, which means you have everything you need. Yeah, your body works, your mind works, like this is a miracle, <laughs> you know? And none of us are getting any younger and death could come at any time. So we wanna remember that this precious opportunity is a finite thing. And if we don't establish really positive mental habits now, the legacy we're leaving our future self is not necessarily going to be a good one, you know, and we're leaving a legacy to ourself in every moment, you know, the inheritance that we'll get, is it going to be as good as the inheritance we received this time? You know, you look at your body and your resources and your mind, and you could think, um, I didn't deserve this, or I didn't deserve this, depending on your mood that day. But this is your inheritance that you gave yourself in your previous life, you know? And so what are you creating for your future? Are you just going, oh, so nice. I'll just enjoy it, not share it, <laughs> feel entitled to it and gather more, you know, or will I take it on the path? So the, the teachings on perfect human rebirth are supposed to motivate us and they're supposed to be an antidote for depression. They don't work as well on Westerners as they do on Tibetans because Tibetans are usually pretty happy-go-lucky, chill people, especially before the Chinese invasion. Um, so telling them you have a great opportunity, it's very rare and precious and you need to use it and being quite strong with them could be very motivating. For us, we might have a lot more kind of, I don't know, mental illness stuff and more, I don't know, complications and things in our life that make us not feel how amazing and precious this life is. And so to touch, I'm very, very lucky without feeling like that's one more way to punish yourself is really hard, you know, because you could start to think, oh, I have all these opportunities and I don't live up to them. You know, we could take it the wrong way. So if you remember that this, this teaching is always about empowering and motivating you and helping you feel inspired, as well as really connected to the fact that if not you, then who, you know, if not now, then when, you know, those ideas that you hear just, it's, it, it's not likely to get better than this unless you practice well, <laughs> you know, so this is, this is it, you know, and um, 
we're the lucky ones because there's plenty of people smarter than us. There's plenty of people with more resources than us, but they haven't necessarily met a spiritual path that is healthy and altruistically motivated. So that puts us in the 1% of the 1% of the 1%. And we really do have a responsibility to do something with that. Um, and that then creates a ripple effect for those around us. So that's the, the perfect human rebirth spiel, which is very important. And then from that place, it talks about abandoning your native land, the source of, all, of the three poisons. So this second verse, um, this is one of the more controversial verses in 37 Practices of a Bodhisattva. And um, it's important to unpack what do they mean by homeland or native land and what do they mean by the three poisons. So our homeland is our most familiar mental states. And those most familiar mental states are the three poisons, anger, attachment, and ignorance. This is what we're the most accustomed to. This is like, this is, this is like home for us. It's not talking about a physical home. It's talking about what we're native to. And as soon as you're tired, as soon as you're hungry, as soon as a few things don't go the way you want, our default is anger, attachment, or ignorance. We're all three, you know? And so it's like, if you want to get meaning out of this human existence, we have to abandon our native land. And so the verse is, the practice of all bodhisattvas is to leave behind one's homeland, where our attachment to family and friends overwhelms us like a torrent, while our aversion towards enemies rages inside us like a blazing fire, and delusion's darkness obscures what must be adopted and abandoned. So this is the thing, family and friends are wonderful, but they encourage attachment. Um, enemies can be useful sources of patience practice, but usually aversion is what comes and it turns into anger and it rages inside us. And because generally speaking, delusion, ignorance is our MO, we're not really sure what we should do and what we shouldn't do. And so if we wanna be a bodhisattva, we need to abandon our homeland. It's, there, there's so many levels you can look at this one, isn't it? You can, you can look at it from the perspective of also identity, you know? What is your identity, whether it's your nationality or your ethnicity or your gender or your financial status or your religious beliefs or whatever it is, you could sort of call these identity points homelands in a sense. And when you anchor your identity, then immediately there's it's like you could be like well merely labeled i'm a woman sure no problem but if you're like i'm a woman you know then it becomes like men are other you know and be like well generally speaking i'm an american although i've lived in australia more than half my life i think you know but if i'm holding on to it and someone's like you're not american enough or you're too american it becomes a point of conflict so homeland can mean a lot of things of course the core of the teaching is anger, attachment, and ignorance, these are our defaults. But there's all these layers on top of that because of them that are also the problematic homeland. Anything that is creating a very strong border, you know, physically or psychologically or whatever, as soon as there's that hard lined border, others feel scary or you want them to give you something or you want them to get away or there's a push and a pull so in you know when we talk about the emptiness of inherent existence and we start going into um, ultimate truth we talk a lot about how everything is merely labeled by the mind but i think even talking about it in a conventional sense if you could unpack each of your identity points and then plug on to it merely labeled by the mind, it starts softening the borders. So you can still have boundaries, but they're not barriers. Yeah. Um, does aversion fall under the category of anger or ignorance? Aversion falls under the category of anger, um, but both anger and attachment, of course, come from ignorance. So ignorance is our, you know, big bad guy that's always been there. And then because of that, um, 
kind of illusion of separateness that it gives us. We're attached to those that seem to benefit the self and have aversion to those that seem to harm the self. And the imagery of this verse, you know, like you're stirred up like a torrent, like a storm, or you're burning like fire. It really is describing how we are in any given day. It's just, we're so used to it. We don't notice how painful it is sometimes. Most of the day, we're feeling like this is too much or not enough. I want more. I want less. You come closer, you get further away. We're constantly just like regulating distance and adjusting and readjusting and readjusting. Very rarely in the day do you feel this is exactly right. You know, like Goldilocks, like we're not just huh. the right amount of words, the right temperature, the right everything. I am content and grounded. Yeah, because we have this innate ignorance, which is forever othering, and then there's push and pull all day long. So, so yeah, yeah, no, it's a good question. So these three poisons, anger, attachment, ignorance, they're very common words. They're words you've known your whole life, but in Buddhism, remember, they always do mean something slightly different. They're just the closest word we could get in English. So attachment in Buddhism is not like attachment in psychology. Attachment in Buddhism always means you're exaggerating or you're projecting on top of something good and you're giving it more emphasis than it actually needs or should have. So you're seeing the good that is there relatively, but you're seeing it in isolation from the rest of the story or you're thinking that it's more permanent than it is. And because of our attachment, then we build these expectations that are doomed to fail. And then when the spell of attachment is broken, anger is right on its heels. And anger from a Buddhist perspective means the wish to harm. So it's not just being upset. Like sometimes when we say, oh, I'm so angry, we just mean we're a little bit upset. But in Buddhism, when we say anger, we mean the wish to harm and retaliate. Like you didn't give me what I wanted, whether you agreed to or not, whether it's reasonable or not, you didn't give me what I wanted. And now I'm mad at you and I'm going to punish you. And the way I'm going to punish you might be very socially acceptable and polite. I might just give you a cold, grumpy face, but it's still like a wish to harm. You know, it's just hard to name it as such when it's like passive aggressive and polite. Yeah. When it's aggressive aggressive, it's easy enough to catch. Right. But a lot of the time, our anger, we don't realize that there's the wish to harm really present there. And that's not how we want to live, but it's there. So if we didn't have ignorance, we wouldn't have anger and attachment. Right now, it's like that picture of the three animals and they're kind of eating the tail of one another and they all reinforce each other. So I think most skillful is just to ask yourself on an ordinary day, don't go the way I want. Am I more likely to get grumpy or sad or vague? Yeah. Like when it's, you know, it's not like a horrible day, but just something didn't go right. Do you kind of vague out and get spacey and lazy and just kind of like wander around the house, starting things and not finishing them? Or do you just kind of get irritable and grumpy and everything pisses you off? Or do you get kind of like needy and like wanting validation and like looking for something to feed your senses? And of course, all of us do all three, but kind of we often have like a default one that's like our worst offender. And that's useful knowing, you know, and you think, okay, I'm an attachment person. So that means when I'm enlightened <laughs> or in its enlightened version, I'm going to have excellent discriminating awareness. So it's just an energy. It can go dis diluted. It can go more enlightened. It's fine. But um, knowing that about yourself, is very useful. Yeah. Cause that's where you work. You work on the coarsest stuff first. Yeah. Yeah. So that verse is a little bit confronting. Um, how, uh, thoughts on that? Questions on that? Verse number two. I have a, I'll just start saying sentences and hopefully it'll make enough for you to react to. But when you talk about how anger within the context of Buddhism is the wish to harm. Yeah. I, I have a tendency to frame all of my emotions in a very sort of high-minded self-righteous way. So I don't think that I'm actually getting angry. I feel like, and I genuinely do feel like this, um, the feeling that I'm feeling 
is that I want the object of whatever word to stop harming someone else. So it's not that I think that they're bad or that I, you know, I don't want them to hurt. I want all of it to stop. Mm. You know, and I think about that in a, without diving into it, but like at systems levels. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like moral outrage kind of a thing. Yeah. Ju- in, injustice yeah. Um, like that. And so I don't know how to always work with that because I don't want to, you know, it's not, not an eye for an eye kind of feeling. It's just, can't we be more awake, more wise, stop it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think we probably all relate, especially, you know, at the politics as they have been. Um, I think that we've been trained improperly in especially activist communities. Like, I don't know how many of you are involved in activist work, but I remember in the 90s when I was more into these things, a thing I would hear a lot is if you're not angry, you're not paying attention, right? It's classic, yeah. So if you're not angry, you're not paying attention or you don't care. And we've been kind of trained to think that. Whereas in Buddhism, you're saying to yourself, I care so much, I cannot allow anger to drive this. This is so important, I'm not going to let anger ruin it. So it's very, very much the opposite of how the world trains us to meet injustice. In Buddhism, we're definitely looking at injustice and wanting to right wrongs and wanting to really change systemic things when it makes sense to, when we have power to do so, but not hitting our head against the wall when it's the wrong time and we're not having an impact. And, you know, that's the question of our age is when then, and how do we know? Um, But for, for me as an individual, you know, sometimes the communities I live in, something will be a little bit weird in a procedure or a policy and it needs to be addressed. And I know that sometimes people respond well to passion and they will respond well to like assertiveness and very direct, strong speech. And sometimes they respond well to kind of a a more friendly, jokesy, folksy kind of a way. And sometimes cool, calm logic. And all of those are just skills of communication that I need to read the room and know which is the one that's going to get the point across here. And I'm not going to be able to access any of those tools if my mind is agitated, you know? So it's like what might look like anger to someone, you know, someone looking might actually just be kind of a passionate, assertive response that seems like the right moment for, but you have to be calm in order to be able to choose. And if you're not calm, then you just kind of default you know, and kind of a emotion vomit, which might work for a minute. But I think what happens usually is that when we are having like a moral outrage and something needs to change and we're um, does need to change is that we meet the aggression of the other side with a kind of a wanting to dominate energy. Like you're really wrong and you need to stop dominating energy rather than kind of coming up and under and asking, what are you so afraid of that's making you this aggressive? And how can I remove that fear with education, resources, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those things are harder work than just smushing someone's argument with your superior argument or your dominant energy. But they're more sustainable because then the person has changed from within. They've not just been authoritied into submission because what happens then is then they just brew and are disgruntled and are just quietly disgruntled until there is an opening for their rage to pop out again. So it's not like you solved anything. You just kind of squashed it for a second. You know? Yeah. It's tricky. (laughs) It's, It's very tricky, but I think, you know, for us to say just because I'm angry doesn't mean I'm right, but just because I'm angry doesn't mean I'm wrong either. Either way, I need to sober up from my anger before I choose a decision, you know, and this is too important to let anger drive it. Even if historically you needed your anger to be motivated, you know, you don't have to think I was bad because 20 years ago, the only thing that got me off my butt and changed things that were important was my anger. Good, you changed things. But now, <laughs> now you're trying to be a bodhisattva. So you just kind of upgrade, you know, <laughs> we all did what made sense at the time. Um, okay, so some questions from the comments. First one is, 
an aversion to ignorance seems sort of self-perpetuating. Where should the focus shift in order to alleviate the cycle? Do what you have energy for in the moment. Do you have energy to look at the method side of the path or the wisdom side of the path? The method side of the path is really accessible because it's compassion and love and patience and things that you already knew and thought were a good idea before you ever met Buddhism. And cultivating those prevents negative states of mind from arising. Once you already have a negative state of mind arising, then wisdom is more useful or even just being present and letting it settle. So preemptive strike, you know, cultivate the good things that prevent the bad things. Sometimes it's too late. In that case, you need to inject wisdom into it to kind of break it apart and um, dissolve it. So, you know, the ignorance can be worked on really whenever you feel energy to dive more deeply into the nature of reality. But in terms of daily life, I think um, preemptive strike of just keeping a mind really imbued with compassion as your default is going to hold you in the best stead. And then gradually as your study process, unpack the things that are the antidote to ignorance, because the wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherent existence is in one sense a very simple idea that ties you into interdependence, but is actually a very subtle point, which directly confronts our sense of self, which is a delicate and dangerous place to play in our practice. And it needs a lot of background, context and logic. If that makes sense. So, of course, all of the all of the afflictions are self perpetuating in, in the sense that they all help each other continue on. And then you just kind of grab the tail of the one that's in front of you and say, what do you want? And start working with that one, you know. Yeah, so, yeah, it's an individual choice, but generally speaking, it's it's good to motivate yourself with a positive state of mind because it prevents negative states of mind. It doesn't mean it finishes the tendency for them. You know, what finishes the tendency for them is wisdom, but that's it's a much harder, longer kind of project. So you kind of want to be calm enough to be able to examine it. Yeah. Anyway, slowly, slowly. Um, and then... There's another question, which is how can you control anger of unhappiness, dissatisfaction? Is sitting with the energy until it dissipates? Um, certainly sitting with the energy until it dissipates can work. Um, if you imagine the energy of anger or dissatisfaction as like a wave kind of crashing over you and you're just kind of holding still as it crashes over you, it's important to remember that negative states of mind are very good at using your powers of analysis against you. So when you're angry or when you're attached or when you're depressed, if you start analyzing from that place, your very good analytical processes will get all tangled with the delusion and you'll reinforce the idea why it's only reasonable for you to stay depressed, angry, or attached. You know, you'll get really convincing arguments and no one will be able to talk you out of it. So it's like, don't fall on your own sword. Don't analyze while you're attached, angry, depressed. Yeah, wait until the wave passes and then go back and analyze it then on either end of it, you know, before it happens and after it happens. But in the middle of it, yeah, let it roll through and dissipate um, or do something physical, but some sort of circuit breaker to get you out of that kind of self-convincing mindset that can happen. Yeah. Okay, so I thought now we take um, just a little break. We've set the scene, you've got the context, and now we'll um, come back and um, do a little meditation and a few more verses. So.